Okay, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here and also to share some perspectives from Latin America to this very important Asia Pacific sociological or socialist <laughs> association uh, uh, meeting uh, on reimagining development futures. And in particular, my topic is transforming the food system for a post COVID world. And uh, the food system is one of the the elements of development that urgently needs to be reimagined. And as our former, the former speaker said, uh, we have to go beyond the sustainable development status quo. And we have to think about the need for radical transformation. Uh, and I say this as sociologists or as socialists, <laughs> we need to face the hard facts. Next. And so I want to uh, comment on the unequal world that's in crisis after COVID, of course it was in crisis before COVID, but it's in more crisis now. And particularly with the war in Ukraine, we've seen some more elements of this crisis. We have a health crisis of food related disease and illness, recurrent pa pandemics, which are mostly related to our food system. We have an economic crisis with recession and unemployment, very slow economic recovery from COVID made more slow by the spillover effects from the war in Ukraine. We are facing a tremendous climate crisis, one of the topics of this conference, which is significantly driven by the food system. We're facing an ecological crisis, including deforestation, uh, air and water pollution, poisoning of water with pesticide and chemical fertilizer, runoff with waste from confined animal production operations, what the former speaker called factory farming, uh, particulate matter, pollution, all coming from the food system, and we're facing a food crisis within the food system itself with food shortages and hunger on the rise, rising food costs, and uh, started with COVID or even before COVID, but exacerbated by the effects of the war in Ukraine. And therefore, uh, it is the time for change. And in uh, social movements, and our, and our former speaker called for us to listen to social movements, we call it the reimagining of the food system. We call that food sovereignty. Next. Uh, the overarching problem in our food system is enormous corporate concentration, uh, which makes it very difficult to break out of a very unsustainable and very unhealthy and very disastrous development track. Next. And uh, but we can look at the case of how the relationship between the food system and COVID to see just how serious the problem is. First of all, the first part of the relationship between the food system and COVID, it was how unhealthy diets, heavy, heavy on industrial processed food produced by the corporations in the, pri in the prior slide, created COVID comorbidities, malnour malnourishment, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, certain cancers, etc., increase the probability of mortality from COVID, all of these problems driven by the current corporate industrial food system. And on the other hand, something that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, further on in this presentation, agroecology as an alternative production uh, model for our food system, which would produce healthy food. Next. The, the second relationship between uh, COVID and the food system, the first was comorbidity. The second is the actual cause of COVID. We should remember even before COVID that the industrial livestock system, what our former speaker called factory farming, is widely blamed for earlier pandemics and food related illnesses, including swine flu, avian flu, salmonella outbreaks, E. coli outbreaks, illnesses like the, the dramatic worldwide rise of type two diabetes, heart disease and various cancers. And there was a best-selling book that predicted COVID before COVID came out called Big Farms Make Big Flu. Next. Uh, currently in the scientific literature on epidemiology, molecular biology of COVID, there are only three serious hypotheses that are being managed, uh, being, being discussed by scientists as to the origin. All three are related to the current food system. Either it jumped from wildlife to humans due to forest encroachment by expanding monocultures for livestock feed, uh, like soy, soybeans in Brazil or maize in Northern Thailand and Myanmar, 
or it, ar it arose from the industrial corporate farming of wild animal meat. So there's this theory it came from wild animal meat in the Wuhan market, but it turns out that the same corporate livestock system is mass producing so-called wild meat with the same hormones over confinement of animals, uh, creating the conditions for new uh, viral and flu diseases, or it escaped from a laboratory car carrying, gain of fun carrying out gain of function virus research, and it turns out that that virus research is funded by the industrial meat corporate complex because they know that factory farming will produce new pandemics, and they don't want governments to ban factory farming. Therefore, they try to be ahead of the curve and fund very dangerous virus research. So even if it escaped from a lab, it's still related to our corporate food system. So all three causes, expansion of monoculture, industrial corporate farming of wild animals, or laboratory escape are caused by, would be caused by our food system. Next. Uh, to, to give an example of how the food system is a driver of multiple crises, the corporate food system, I take the industrial meat complex, which is a combination of the global livestock industry and the global livestock feed industry. So we're talking about uh, cows, pigs, chickens, and now wild meats and other animals that are produced under confined, over, under confined conditions using feed produced many times halfway around the world. Uh, this complex is the key driver of unhealthy food through the overuse of antibiotics, gro gro growth hormones, and produces meat with more bad cholesterol and less good cholesterol than, than meat produced by free-range animals on, on the farms of small farmers. It produces disease. It makes us sick, swine flu, bird flu, salmonella, the diseases that I just mentioned. I just mentioned how it's involved in the emergence of COVID. The industrial meat complex, beyond doubt, is one of the key drivers of the emergence of COVID, regardless of which of the three hypotheses proves to be true. Uh, it's driving the transformation, negative transformation of lives, of landscapes and communities. It's the key driver of land, land grabbing and eviction of small farmers, peasants, and indigenous people, and therefore land conflict around the world, key driver of deforestation, soil erosion, moving people into economic dependence, like in northern Thailand, where they go from shifting cultivation to contract farming of maize. Uh, massive indebtedness of farmers is also the result of moving into these livestock feed crops. It's a key driver of the conversion of shifting cultivation and forest into chemical monoculture, whether it's maize in Southeast Asia, soybeans in the Americas, it's forest clearing driving increased greenhouse gas emissions and therefore more climate change, a key driver of climate change. In the case of Thailand and Southeast Asia, it's a key driver of the burning of fields and forests causing the uh, particulate matter pollution. Also in Brazil, the burning of the Amazon uh, for soybeans for livestock feed also is a key, is a key driver of particulate matter. Next. So uh, when we come to climate change as one example of these problems related to the food system, next, next, we can see that, uh, that the food system is perhaps the largest single driver of climate change that we have, uh, whether it's actual agricultural activities, land clearing and deforestation, food processing and transportation, decomposition of waste, the total emissions from the food system account for roughly one half of all greenhouse gas emissions. So if we want to seriously address climate change, we have to seriously reimagine the food system. Next. Uh, uh, the long value chains are highly vulnerable to climate emergencies, to pandemic, to a war that restrict fertilizer supplies. And if we, if, unless we reduce the length of, of value chains for food, every time there's a new crisis emerging at the global level, we're gonna have food shortages and dramatically rising prices again. So we need to relocalize food production at the national, subnational level. We need shorter value chains next. So the solution is relocalized agroecological small farm production of livestock crops and agroforestry systems. I were always asked, for example, on the meat side, if small farms could produce enough meat or if we all have to be vegetarians if we move to an agroecological small farmer model. 
In fact, I won't go into the details, but mathematical calculations show that small farmers around the world could easily, would be happy to, and would profit enormously from being able to produce all of the meat that we would like to eat, and that would be much healthier meat. And, but unfortunately, they are locked out of the meat value chain because corporations have dominated the chain to the point that, they, that small farmers cannot sell meat into the meat value chain. Next. So agroecology, though I don't have time to go into it in detail right now, but at 2.15, we'll be having a, an entire panel discussion today uh, on agroecology and alternative food systems, but it's a science that, I'm, that I work on the sociolog sociological part of because it's a transdisciplinary science. Some of my work since 1990 until recently, it's sometimes called the scientific basis of sustainable agriculture the inter and transdisciplinary science of how agricultural systems work and the scientific basis for the design and study of more sustainable systems, the actual agricultural practices for producing without agrotoxics and GMOs, and it's a global social movement to transform agriculture. Next, uh, the, some of the principles, they are both uh, biological agronomic principles as well as, as sociological principles. Next. Uh, agroecology offers real mitigation of climate change. Our first, uh, 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 the former governor of Bangkok talked about mitigation. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the things being sold by governments and corporations as mitigation are what we call fake solutions. But real mitigation could come from a transition to agroecological farming, eliminating various sources of emissions in that 50% of emissions that come from the food system. Next. Uh, if we had a relocalized food system, which social movements call fo ca called food sovereignty, calculations published in the scientific literature showed that we could eliminate 30 to 75 percent of total soil emissions from various components of the total emissions from the food system. Next. And it also provides real adaptation. Peasant-based agroecology is adaptive because of genetic diversity of peasant seeds. Uh, because of ways to adapt to rising temperatures, shading the soil, c conserving water in the soil, water harvesting practices, etc. In general, agroecological farming uses only 10% of the water that industrial farming use. Next. Uh, can small farmers feed the world? They are feeding the world. I don't have time to go into the data, but the data shows that with only 25% of world cropland small farmers currently produce 70% of the food that we eat, and they could produce all of it if we would stop those con corporately concentrated corporations from monopolizing value chains. Next. So the alternative is transform the food system based on the principles of food sovereignty, coined by the global small farmer, peasant, indigenous people, and farm worker and landless people's movement, La Via Campesina, who will be having a panel tomorrow. Uh, and I, I, I would encourage you all to attend their, their panel tomorrow on the peasant movement in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, but they invented this concept of, of food sovereignty, uh, which is a need to move beyond food security, just as we can say the need to move beyond sustainable development, uh, we, because it matters who produces our food, where our food is produced, and how it is produced. And finally, food is a matter of sovereignty. Next. Uh, it's a response to the food and farming crisis. It's also about local economic development. And it's based on the fact, and this is uh, mathematically proven by the data, that peasant and family farmers are able to and want to feed the populations of their countries. Next. So it's the time for food sovereignty, as the global social movements say. Our former speaker said we need to listen to social movements. Social movements are telling us this. Uh, rural social movements, urban social movements, consumer movements, poor people's movements, peasant movements, indigenous people's movements, family farmer movements, human rights movements, they're all telling us the same thing. Uh, also food and nutrition movements. Next. So with that, I conclude, and uh, as sociologists, we need to get to work on this because it's going to require social mobilization in order to make these changes. Thank you.